Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to uh, MongoDB and the single page web applications. Uh, my name is Josh Powell. Um, despite the t-shirt, I don't work for Tengen. Uh, I just went to one of their conferences uh, and I'm a big fan. Um, I am co-author of the book Single Page Web Applications, JavaScript End-to-End, -End, uh, that's uh, being published by Manning. I've got 13 years of web application development experience. Um, you can find out more on my blog, uh, jsjoshing.com. Uh, you can also find uh, my book on jsjoshing.com as well, or uh, tomorrow there will be a Manning exhibit. You can go and uh, go there. Um, so this talk is going to be about uh, single page web applications, uh, what, what they are, uh, how does Mongo fit into a single page application, um, showing you how to use um, Mongoose a little bit to uh, ease development, and uh, then that's the, about the first half of the talk, and then the second half will demonstrate end-to-end uh, -end Mongo integration into a very rudiment rudimentary uh, single page application. Um, then I'll show you how to uh, use Node.js to monitor Mongo for updates to the collection and then push them out to the spa via WebSockets and Socket.io. Um, so what is a single page application? Uh, at its simplest, it's a page that does not reload. Uh, so think about uh, Gmail. Uh, when you uh, update so, uh, some information on the page, you only update the section of the page that changes, but the rest of the framework uh, stays the same. Uh, that means that there's less code sent across the wire, that there, you get faster load times, and you end up with more responsive uh, applications. Uh, there are uh, several ways to do uh, SPAs. Uh, you know, on the, the include, m today, the usual ways are to do Flash or JavaScript. Uh, but in the past, there was also Java applets, or I guess you could also use Silverlight or some other technologies. Um, but today, JavaScript is really winning that battle for a few reasons. Um, first is that uh, browsers are very widely supported, and uh, JavaScript is native to, to all browsers. So you don't have to, the users don't have to install any plugins and keep plugins up to date in order to use the application. Uh, in, Another reason is instead of having to know another language like Flash Action Script, you can work on the client in just one language, JavaScript. And uh, deployment is trivial. You only need to host uh, files on an HTTP server, and they will be accessible to uh, anyone uh, with web, app web access. Um, JavaScript over time has become uh, truly cross-platform. Um, as converging standards in JavaScript libraries like uh, jQuery, have made uh, developing cross-browser uh, JavaScript code uh, fairly trivial. Um, so even now, JavaScript can at times rival uh, uh, compiled languages in terms of speed. And JavaScript's only going to get faster as Microsoft, Google, and uh, Apple battle it out for browser supremacy. And so modern JavaScript implementations can enjoy some advanced uh, optimizations like uh, just-in-time comp just compilation to machine code, branch prediction, type inference, and uh, multi-threading. And uh, JavaScript now has access to some advanced features like WebSockets, uh, which allow server-initiated communications with all connected clients. Uh, the benefits of a single page application are that it renders and responds like a desktop application. Uh, there is no click and wait and having the screen flash while the page re-renders. Um, it is click and just the relevant section of the page gets updated. Uh, an SPA can also notify users of the state of the application. Instead of relying on the browser to render its spinning icon somewhere in the browser Chrome, you can uh, just update the section of your page that's going to change with your spinner icon, and users can continue to interact with the application while that slow section continues to load. Um, unlike a desktop application, uh, an, S an SPA uh, is available anywhere that there's a, a browser. Um, whereas with a traditional desktop application, you're going to have to develop once for every sort of OS you want it to, to uh, run on. So when deploying an SPA, uh, it's instantly accessible to all of your users. Uh, there's no need for them to download and, ins and install an update. 
Uh, it's just available the next time they go to access the application. Whereas even with, uh, even with mobile phones today and iOS, the, you're still dependent on the user going to the uh, Apple Store and downloading the latest version. And so we've got you know, weeks of time until people are on the latest code. So some drawbacks of an SPA. Uh, the business logic is all in the client. Um, so it's a benefit and it's a drawback. The, the drawback being that uh, you're, you're, you've exposed your business logic to anybody want, that wants to go and look at it. So if you've got some proprietary algorithms, you, you probably want to keep them o over on the server side. Um, it tends to be more of a rare skill set. Uh, JavaScript UI experts are uh, pretty difficult to find. Um, and uh, spot development is a rare, although a growing skill set, especially with new frameworks like Backbone, Spine, Knockout, uh, and others. Um, and, uh, another drawback is that uh, even though we've made a lot of progress with cross-browser issues, uh, there's st it still needs to be considered, especially around older browsers like IE6 and, uh, and with CSS. With the JavaScript, we've got cross-browser libraries that help out, but with CSS, you still have to worry about the differences between different browsers. Um, and, and finally, there's a really no agreed upon client-side design pattern like there is for a traditional web application. They have MVC you know, for those, but um, different uh, frameworks are trying different things right now. You'll find MVVM, MVR, um, or the one we use in our book, MFC, which is Model Feature Controller. So how does Mongo fit into uh, an SPA, a single page application? Uh, well, there are three benefits, uh, and these benefits are more about, um, you know, if, if you remember the keynote from this morning, it's more about the form of, of the application, and um, I'm not going to go into so much, I'm not going to go into at all, like benchmarking or scaling, but just talk about development of the application itself. Uh, so one benefit is when combined with Node.js, you can uh, program in JavaScript from end to end in your application. Um, the data structures that you're consuming on the client are being consumed in the exact same structure they're stored in in the database, and uh, the ever popular schemaless, no migrations. So uh, JavaScript end to end, of course you've got your JavaScript on the client in the browser. Uh, on the server you've got Node.js, uh, which is just running the, uh, the, the Chrome JavaScript engine on the server side to execute JavaScript. And then you've got uh, MongoDB, uh, which has a JavaScript uh, interface uh, for interacting with your data. Um, so so that, that's beneficial because it means less content switching, context switching for the developer and less overall knowledge needed to get building a full stack applications. Somebody can learn JavaScript and immediately start writing full stack. Uh, whereas if you're working in a traditional framework, you're doing, you have to learn JavaScript, HTML, CSS, or Ruby, Rails, SQL, or Java, Spring MVC, or PHP and Django, or you know, whatever. But you have to know a whole, a whole lot of different things. Um, let's see. So the, another advantage is that uh, the data that's stored in the database is the exact same format and structure as needed on the client. And this is your more traditional uh, web application up here where you'll make an AJAX call to the server uh, that will be transmitted in JSON, which will then be on a Ruby on Rails server will be converted to active record. Active record will then convert to SQL and issue the SQL queries against the relational database which will then return uh, you know, it, it, its uh, relational responses uh, and convert those back to active record, which will then just be converted over to JSON and sent back across the wire to be consumed on the client side. Uh, whereas if you're using Mongo and Node.js, uh, you talk from the client JSON to the server JSON. You go from JSON to the server to the JSON to the database, JSON from the database back to the server, and then JSON onto the client to be consumed. So you're spending a lot less time marshalling data between different structures and uh, moving it around so that it'll fit. You just take it and pass it along. Uh, 
so schemaless, no migrations. Uh, Mongo is schemaless, and that means no migration files. There's no replication delays from migrating big tables. Uh, there's no special syntax to remember for doing your migrations. Uh, an entire aspect to building and maintaining an application is just gone. Uh, many of the issues we have at work with MySQL uh, have to deal with updating the schema. Uh, most of our downtime is for schema updates. Uh, our replication delays are because of schema updates. Uh, working late for engineers are because of schema updates. And most, uh, the most often reviewed and debated code for all of those reasons is schema updates. Uh, but uh, schemas also provide some benefit. They are there to help define what the data will look like. Uh, otherwise, you can just stick anything into the database anywhere and you have no idea what, who's putting what in. Uh, so there are solutions to help out with that with Mongo. Um, one of them is called Mongoose, and uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, so using the Node.js Mongo driver directly in your application would be rather like using uh, just JDBC to interact with the relational database directly or handwriting SQL queries in Ruby. Uh, well, and while there are times that you want to drop down to those low levels and do that, um, we can learn from the successes of these other technologies and how they've abstracted away the raw interaction with the database. Uh, in the SQL world, this is done with an ORM, an object relational mapping. Uh, in Mongo, this can be done with an ODM, which is object document mapping, of which uh, Mongoose uh, is one. Um, Mongoose also has the added benefit uh, that in addition to just interacting with the database, you can use Mongoose to, to define your schema and require any documents being inserted into the database will have to follow the schema that you've set up. Um, so, you know, we talked about not having a schema on the database being a benefit, but then why ever would you want to write your schema in the application? Well, you're now moving um, a lot of your code that has to be deployed out to the database that is causing all these database issues separate from your application. Uh, you're, and you're taking it and applying it into the application layer. So you no longer have to time your migration and deployments to be at the same time. Uh, you can just deploy your, your application code. Um, uh, it also means that you can define your columns, or equivalent to your columns, your records, uh, to fit any requirement that you can think of instead of having to go with the predefined column definitions uh, that the database has provided. Uh, for example, you could require that phone numbers uh, have to look like phone numbers when they're stored. You, you not have to convert it to numbers and then back out again or save it as a var char or whatever hack there is to store that. You can require that your data have the parentheses around the area code and have the dash. Um, all right, so now let's take a look at uh, an example SPA uh, using Node.js and MongoDB, uh, keeping the same data format from the client to the database. So first I'm just going to start up Mongo here and take a look at what databases I have in Mongo. And there's a list of them but uh, you guys read that? Yeah, all right. The one we care about is SBA. So I'm gonna use SPA and look at the collections, which are Mongo's equivalent of tables. I've got a cars, model names, and users. Uh, the one we're gonna use is users. So we're gonna read dbusers.find. Uh, this is the equivalent of select star from users. Uh, and then you can even take it and say we want to make it look nice. All right, there we go. So here's our users stored in uh, documents, in JSON documents in the database. I've got uh, the ID, the name, username, address, and password. Uh, let me take and fire up the node server. All right, it's listening. Here. All right. And local host. 
So there's our users uh, and just, just this simple application here. Um, let me refresh the page. And you can see it made this Ajax call uh, to, to list all the users. And it came back in exactly the same format as was stored in the Mongo database. Name, username, address, password, and two JSON documents. It's just passed on up here to the front end the same way. So if we want to uh, take a look at a user, it made an Ajax call to users read and passed in the uh, user ID, the, Mo that's the Mongo ID. And you go to the database. A little bit long query, so I'm just going to copy it. And make the same query, you just get the same JSON document. All it's doing is taking the JSON document directly out of the database and passing it up to the UI. Um, so let's take a code, a look at the code in the middle tier that uh, makes this possible. So here's the code for the middle tier. This is what Node.js application uh, looks like. Um, is there anybody here who's familiar with Node.js, has used it in the past? No? Nope. All right. Um, so all we're doing here is uh, requiring a bunch of JavaScript files. These are basically the equivalent of the script tag on the client side. And then we're passing in some configurations. Oh, here's where we use Mongoose to connect to the Mongo database. And here we're defining a, a user object or a user model. Uh, these down here are routes that are getting called uh, that are going to match the URL that gets passed in up here uh, or that pa gets passed in here. So this call is made to slash users slash read slash ID. And so users read ID gets called. Um, and actually, let me step into the user model here. So this is Mongoose and how it defines a schema for MongoDB. Um, you just require the Mongoose uh, script and call mongoose.schema and pass in a JSON structure uh, that defines how the schema is supposed to look. In this case, I just defined a bunch of strings. Um, but what that does is it constrains so that if you try to save a user object and it has additional uh, attributes, it just doesn't save them. Uh, so they don't get persisted to the database. So once you've got your Mongoose schema, you can then use Mongoose to define a model based off that schema uh, called user, and then we export it back to here. So that brings us back down to the route we have defined where we're just taking that user object, we're calling findById, which is a Mongoose built-in method uh, that expects a, uh, an ID and um, a callback function. Uh, the callback function gets called once Mongo uh, responds, uh, and it gives you, if there's an error, it's the first parameter, and if it's a success, it takes the document and, uh, from Mongo and sends it back to you. Uh, then we take that docu the document response from Mongo, and response.send, we just send it directly off to the, to the client without doing any manipulation to it. Um, any questions there? Yep. Can I define? So, um, well, Mongo automatically puts ID fields on, well, underscore ID on all of its documents. Uh, so, uh, you probably could define ID colon, uh, and then using Mongo, you can define uh, how you want your IDs to look. Um, in this case, I just went with the, the default ID formatting for Mongo, which is a, that, that long uh, string. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, let's see. Where was I? I'm uh, looking to use our back to JS. Uh, Mongoose is a module that you can add on to, to Node.js. It's, it's, it's uh, built by and maintained by a separate company. What's the security for Node.js? I think it's 0.8. 
What's that? Under 1.0. Yeah, it's under 1.0 still. Um, all right, so let's take a look at the client side to see what we're doing with that uh, JSON document once it hits the, the client. Um, so this is just jQuery here to uh, line 10 here means on page load. Uh, we're going to set a click event on all the elements with the class of name. That's these guys here, just the names. Now when that click event is called, we're going to call the function show user, passing in the attribute uh, from that node of the user ID attribute, which is this guy here that's just printed out as an attribute on that element. Uh, show user uh, takes that ID, makes an AJAX call to user slash read, and when he gets a response, it passes that response through this template function and then puts it directly into the HTML of the page. Uh, this template function, uh, all we do is uh, access those attributes that are passed back out of Mongo directly and build a table around them. And then we take that table here and just .html just sticks it into the page in the div with the ID of user. Okay, um, any questions about that? All right, so next I'm gonna show you uh, something that I think is pretty cool and it's something that um, you can do with Node.js, particularly easy, uh, which is using uh, WebSockets. Uh, WebSockets will end up locking up uh, Apache-based applications uh, because Apache uses threads instead of an event-based processing queue. Uh, Node.js is event-based processing by default. So when somebody makes a connection to it, if that connection is held open, uh, it doesn't take Node much, if any, effort to maintain that connection. It's just listening for an event. And when an event comes down, then it actually goes and starts, uh, starts doing something. Um, so we're going to use the same application as before, but this time we'll add Socket.io node module uh, to manage our web sockets and connections. Uh, Socket.io also brings backwards compatibility to browsers that uh, haven't implemented web sockets and never will, like IE6. Um, so let me scroll back over here. Cancel this. Yes. So now you can see in the log here that since we've got Socket.io on here, it logs out that yes, Socket.io has started. Um, let's see. Okay, so now move this around a little bit. Refresh the. Oh, sorry, me. Okay, sorry, I started the wrong application there. All right, so let's start it up. Let's open up Chrome and have it running. And let's open up Safari. Same application. Now, uh, what I'm gonna do is gonna add a user and you're gonna see Socket.io is going to um, push that new user to the other browsers who are just sitting there with an open WebSockets connection and they're not doing any polling, they're just sitting there with an open connection. So I can go add user, user, and it just instantly updates on the other browsers. I go and delete, instantly deletes on the other browsers. Um, so let me here show, now show you how we've accomplished that. Uh, close these guys down. So here's the same uh, th same uh, application we had before, but this time we've required the socket I/O and we've told it to listen to the server. Uh, then we've got uh, var variable current users set to an array, 
And then every uh, 100 milliseconds, uh, we're telling it to call the watch Mongo function. Watch Mongo uses the same user object that we had before and uh, d does a user.find and sorts all the re results by uh, name in ascending order, uh, executes them, and then compares the length of the response with the length of current users. So if you've added or removed users, uh, it's going to execute uh, it's going to set current users to users to record the change, and then it's going to io.sockets.emit uh, users. And that, that's just the, the syntax you use to uh, use uh, io to push uh, information up to the browser. Uh, then on the client side, oh, where is it? Uh, you've, we've got this io.connect on users. And it tells it here, this is the name of the socket to listen to, the user socket. And it was defined he here. So we're, we're emitting and re reading from the same place. And then, oh, on app.js, this users, this is the same document that Mongo passed to us uh, from, from in the, the last time. So users.find is the response from that. And it's just getting pushed up via the socket instead of via an AJAX request. Um, it comes through here and then is uh, passed through reload user list, which just writes out our user list using the same um, JSON document passed to us from Mongo. Um, Okay, now I want to have a little bit of fun with this and see if we can crash it. Uh, what I'm going to do is look and see my IP address on here, 215. I'm going to take my web application and tell it to listen on port 3000 on 215. Then I'm going to stop the application Run it again. Uh, let me close uh, Firefox and Safari. And go there. All right, now uh, guys that have laptops open, go to this address here and start adding users. It, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, IO, that comes with a script tag that you'll enter. Um, it comes with a script tag from socket IO. So it's a socket, it's not a native JavaScript thing, it comes with socket IO. Oh, there we go, Peter's added one. Bill, as you can see, don't have to refresh anything. Everybody's connecting to the Node.js server, adding things to MongoDB. Yep. You maybe you should show this, but I didn't have this. Uh, was there any, was this event driven from, from MongoDB or did you pull MongoDB? I'm pulling MongoDB with Node.js. You have to pull. Yeah, I'm pulling. Uh, this kind of related to my question and or different. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, like if, the, if there was a real time feed that. Yeah, or if there's, yeah, yeah or if you could have MongoDB emit something saying I've updated or, yeah. All right, well, it looks like my MacBook Air can handle this traffic just fine. <laughs> um, all right, so that's all the time I have. Um, so this is kind of just a little taste of, of, of this talk. I'm gonna continue with a couple of upcoming meetups. Um, one at the Silicon Valley NoSQL Meetup Group on September 6th in Sunnyvale, and another one with the San Francisco MongoDB User Group in San Francisco on September 18th. Um, you can check my blog at jsjoshing.com, and uh, it has the updates and information about where I'll be speaking. Um, 
and so what I hope what I'll, I'll additionally be showing there is how you can use Mongo to enforce uh, other interesting constraints like I had shown you don't have to do just strings or one that's built into the database but you can actually do you know anything you can do a regex expression for or think about in order to constrain data being put into the database um, and then I'm going to show the rest of the CRUD operations. We did read and list here, but I'll show you how to do updates, deletes, creates, uh, and it's pretty much just the same kind of length of code that is, was there. And then we'll go into more detail on uh, Socket IO and, and how it, we used it to interact with DB, MongoDB. Yep, so questions? Is there a source um, I haven't put it up there yet. I'll probably put it up on GitHub and uh, on jsjoshing.com, I'll let people know. Uh, any other questions? I have a question. When you have a single page application, um, what strategies do you use to allow for version updates to be so Good question. Um, so Google will actually spider uh, single page applications if you use a hash bang when you're recording the uh, path of the URL. So, um, in the book, we explain how we use a, a we drive the updates of a single web page application through updating the URL, uh, and specifically the hashtag. Um, so it's this portion here. So if you do, get a little bar. So uh, and a lot of times you'll see in single page applications, what they'll do is they'll update something on the page, and then they'll update the URL uh, afterwards. Um, but what you want to do is have the portion after the URL actually execute the event that updates the page. So that way, when you pass it around to somebody in email or you bookmark it, uh, the single page application will come and show this uh, page, and then it will execute what's in the hashtag. Uh, Google, when you do have this hash bang here, uh, instead of just the hashtag, you're telling Google, I want you to spider this. Go ahead and execute this JavaScript, change the stuff on, uh, well, it doesn't execute the JavaScript. You on the server side have to accept this request and return a page that you get to format how you want to. Uh, so you would have to actually return Right, but you get the additional advantage of you get to tailor that page to exactly what you want it to look like for Google. So all you do is you dump in one image in there, whatever the top image you want to show on Google is, and then a bunch of SEO optimized text. And then when somebody goes to the Google search engine and clicks on that link, it brings them to this page with the hashtag, with the hash bang, and it actually opens what, you, what the person should be seeing instead of Google. I'm sorry, can you ask again? So, so sometimes, I mean, it's easy to, uh, to develop a small application. So uh -huh. I'm wondering how it scales in terms of source code. So when we have more complex applications, we have um, I think it's getting to the point where it scales quite well. Um, we've got, especially if you're using Mongo as your backend, and you can use Mongoose as your ODM, because then you can define models like you normally could. but. Um, you know, if you're using a relational database, I don't know of an of a uh, ORM personally that that uh, works as well as like Active Record does for Ruby on Rails. So you're back to writing a lot of your uh, code by your SQL code by hand. Um, so it's just like if you didn't have Hibernate or Ibatus for for Java and you just had to write raw SQL queries. So. Uh, Node.js is maturing as a language, and in some places it works very well, and, and I think one of those is with MongoDB and Mongoose. So is there an example of a large deployment of, of something that is like a complex known application? For Node.js? Uh, the LinkedIn mobile app. Which one? The LinkedIn's mobile app is built in Node.js. Link what? LinkedIn? LinkedIn. LinkedIn? Yeah. Well, LinkedIn. LinkedIn. So, so you mean it's written in Node.js? Yeah, their mobile application is written entirely in Node.js. Oh, that's <laughs> yep. Yep. D did for me. So I'm used to divisions of 180 to 100 developer rich UI applications. 
Uh-huh. You want to push back to like, get our, from our Java developers that are used to Eclipse and our uh, .NET developers that are used to Visual Studio's development tools for debugging and also the richness of the components available in JavaScript right now. Mm -hmm. Sure, there's an uh, IDE called WebStorms, which is new, that is uh, pr proven very popular. Um, but of course, it being a newer environment, it's not going to be as well developed as, say, Eclipse or IntelliJ are. But um, I found I don't need it. Like, when I'm programming in Java, I absolutely need an IDE to help autocomplete and tell me what all these things are and be able to follow code around. and. Um, uh, I, I just haven't needed that myself when, when working with it. Um, and it, it's definitely a young uh, ecosystem, but I think the ecosystem is has been ramping up uh, rather quickly, um, even quicker than Ruby on Rails ecosystem is ramped up. And that's because of the popularity of being able to develop in one language across the entire stack. Uh, Eclipse and IntelliJ, uh, for example, are very good at developing in Java, but um, even with their plugins, it really sucks developing JavaScript in them. So uh, the, even they only handle a portion of what you're, what you're writing and talking about. What about common control libraries for user interfaces? Uh, for user interfaces? Well, then you're reliant on um, the user interfaces that are the, the code that's written for the client. Um, so then you're talking about, you know, there's jQuery UI, jQuery mobile. Um, you could do, you know, Dojo or ext.js on the front end. Um, uh, at work for our enterprise application, we're using ext.js because it has widgets for everything you can think of. Uh, so you, you just have to be uh, selective about what you're going to be developing it in on the client side. All right, any more questions? All right, great. Thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs>